let's kick off. Um, welcome everybody to this morning's webinar hosted by Legitimate Leadership. Uh, the title of the webinar is Where, have, Where Are Our Leaders? And the subtext is working from home or working remotely is not the same as leading from home or leading remotely. And that is what we're going to be talking about, leading remotely and uh, hopefully learning some tips and tricks from some of the experts. My name is Ian Munro. I will be hosting this uh, discussion this morning. And um, I will be joined by Dom Parry. Dom is the CTO of a business called Simply Financial Services. Dom has been working remotely and working on big distributed projects with organizations like IBM over the last um, almost 20 years and has a lot of experience that he can share with us around how do you lead, how do you lead teams and how do you lead large teams remotely. So welcome, Dom. We look forward to hearing from you this morning. Thanks, Ian. I'm also Appreciate joined it. in conversation by Dave Stevens. Dave is actually Hello. a longtime uh, colleague and a friend of mine. Dave um, and I met one another about 15 years ago in a business called BSG, and we had a fantastic uh, time in that organization. And Dave has subsequently worked with organizations like T-Systems and, um, and Mint, and he is now part of our organization. So I, I once again call Dave a colleague. Dave has been an integral part of um, a research study that we've been doing recently or an investigation into um, leadership at this time. And a lot of people are experiencing uh, leading remotely for the first time while people are not in the office. So Dave brings a lot of experience um, and Dave, you'll be able to share with us what people have been uh, talking to you about as you've spoken to more than, uh, I think it's almost 50 people um, in interviews across um, various industries and organizations and countries. So both okay. Dave and uh, Dom, welcome and thank you for joining us this morning. Thank you everyone who's on the call for joining us. Um, please, please participate in the conversation through the chat function um, or if you would prefer, just unmute yourself and, uh, and talk. Um, there seem to be um, currently around uh, 70 or 80 people on the call. Um, there may be a few more joining, but it's not a totally unmanageable number, so we can certainly have a conversation um, in, uh, in real time if you don't want to use the chat function. We will be recording this session, um, so please be aware of that. If you want to say something uh, too outrageous, you know, please hold back. Um, otherwise, uh, hopefully this is going to be a little bit of fun. I will um, start by asking Dave to share some of his um, observations uh, as to what the challenges are currently facing um, leaders who are leading remotely. And then I'm going to bring Dom into the conversation to talk about some of the solutions and the tips and tricks that he has found really, uh, really helpful and have really helped him over the years. And of course, I will... Um, I will share what I have learned um, over the years and, uh, and some of the insights from our framework as well, um, mostly just because I can't, I can't help it. <laughs> right. So, um, Dave, welcome and over to you. Great. Thanks, Ian. Uh, Dom, thanks for joining us. Thanks, everybody. Uh, nice to see a few friendly faces in front of us. Um, yeah, so as Ian mentioned, uh, we've been running a, an exercise for, for the past two months um, where, you know, I've, you know, I've personally chatted to exactly 49 people um, over the past two months, some of them managers, some of them non-managers, all of them from, from our client uh, organizations or our clients. Um, and really what I've been trying to understand is, amongst other things, their experience of, of or their experiences of working remotely over the past five months. Um, Obviously, you know, the whole world has been thrust into this, uh, not by choice. And uh, so there's been some really enlightening feedback and, and comments that I've, I've picked up. This has been a bigger exercise um, across legitimate leadership. It's not just myself. Um, just in terms of what I've done, though, um, you know, which has brought us to today. Like I said, it's been two months. Um, the 49 people we've spoken to have been across three industries, um, quite disparate industries. Um, so some really different views. Some of, some of the people we've spoken to are re reasonably used to 
uh, working remotely. Others, it is a completely foreign thing to them. Um, we've had representation from at least eight cities and towns. Uh, one person I spoke to happened to be in the middle of the Karoo, which I actually found quite interesting, uh, you know, just a <laughs> strange place to be talking to somebody about this sort of thing. Uh, like I said, 49 interviews. I've spent in excess of 50 hours doing this. So that includes the interview time, uh, actually talking to people, which is roughly an hour for each individual. Uh, sorry, roughly half an hour for each individual. Um, but a lot of time, you know, piecing together themes, information, and, uh, you know, and trying to make some sense of what everybody's saying for, for today. Um, so really what I want to try and do today is is talk through uh, the three, what I see at the moment as key themes uh, or challenges that, that have come out of my conversations uh, when the exercise is over with, uh, with legitimate leadership in totality, we'll, we'll have spoken to around about 20 clients, uh, somewhere near 300 people. You know, it's going to be quite, quite an extensive uh, process, probably in excess of, about 500 or 600 hours of effort will have gone into this. So I think as this progresses over time, we'll get a really nice view, you know, of, of the challenges of, of leading remotely, um, you know, through the mouths of, of those leading and those actually working remotely as one and being led. Right, so let me, uh, before I get into the first theme, um, there are three. It's obviously not all of the, of the, of the themes that have come up. I've picked three that I think are, are the most pertinent for now. Uh, and what I've also done is paraphrased a little bit. I obviously can't go into all of the, all of the feedback that we've got. So the first, the first key theme that has popped up for me is that leaders haven't clarified expect, expect, jeepers, expectations and standards for working remotely. And this is coming through in a number of different comments that that we're getting or that I was hearing. For example, and I'm going to go through these one by one. Um, I think it's worthwhile. My boss calls me whatever time suits him. It's clear that the boundaries between work and home have been incredibly blurred. In fact, somebody mentioned to me in one of my interviews, they said, uh, it's no longer working from home. It feels like I'm living in the office, which I think was a really nice way to, to sum that up. Um, some people just switch off their video and stay in bed. We're at work, you know, not on holiday. And what's coming through here is, is etiquette, is people aren't really understanding what's expected. Um, you know, you probably should still get dressed up, you know, as though you're going to the office. There's still a way of work that needs to be clear. There are too many meetings that have no clear agenda, objectives or outcomes. And then my boss wonders why I'm not prepared. There's a couple of points in there. The first is that there probably are too many meetings. You know, we're having meetings because we feel like we need to connect with people. And, and that's absolutely fine. But that becomes a formal event because you have to set it up. You have to phone somebody. You don't just have a chat to them at the water cooler or at the coffee machine. The second part of it is that these meetings are often unplanned. They're not particularly well structured. And this is causing confusion for people. Probably my favorite comment that, uh, that I received in this theme was really um, somebody said to me, you know, my boss said to me, but you can use the time you used to spend in traffic to work. And, and this particular individual was spending an hour and a half each way to work. So all of a sudden their agreed working day went from eight to 11 hours by expectation. And so really these are the sorts of themes coming through Naturally, I've picked on the, uh, picked on the slightly negative ones, um, just to pull out this theme. There were a lot of positive comment, comment there was a lot of posit um, positive commentary coming through. But what is very clear to me is that as leaders, we really haven't clarified expect expectations and standards for working remotely. For some people, and you're going to hear from Dom a little bit later, you know, this is quite a normal thing for him, for an, a number of other people, they don't know how to be led, nor do they know how to lead remotely. Okay. The second theme that I, uh, that I came across and, and pulled out was, you know, leaders aren't making time to watch the game. Now, those of you familiar with legitimate leadership's framework will understand the concept of watching the game. And what that means is 
you know, it, well, it comes out through, through these sorts of comments. You know, my manager seems more worried about how quickly I answer his call than me actually getting the job done. And uh, Ian, I think it was you that, that gave me this example, which I really liked. It was a in passing sort of comment. You know, if I'm sitting at my desk and I don't answer within one ring of, uh, of Zoom or whatever it is that, that, uh, that rings, the assumption is that I'm not at my desk and therefore I'm not working. And the theme coming through here is that, you know, we're, we're watching the wrong things. We're, we're not watching, uh, you know, the game in the correct way. And we'll get to this in a little bit more detail. Um, another one that came, that came from a manager, I don't have time to watch the game. In fact, I'm on the field playing the game. And our argument here need, would be that uh, you absolutely, as a leader, have to make time to watch the game. I would suspect and I would argue that uh, even if you do make time, a lot of people that we spoke to or I've spoken to would really struggle uh, to know exactly how to watch the game. But that's, you know, that's, a, <laughs> that's an argument and a conversation for another day. The point here being, you know, you really do need to make time to watch the game. It's a really important part of leadership from our perspective. And then the last one is, is quite similar to the first. Um, and that is, you know, we're watching the game to stay afloat. And the person who said this to me said, also a manager said, you know, there's, there's no point in us watching the game, uh, you know, to see what support people need or to see how people can improve if we don't have a business. And, uh, you know, so there's, there's a concern in there from a legitimate leadership perspective that, you know, we, we do need to be watching the game and we need to be watching it for the right reasons. Um, the fact that this is a remote thing that we need to do changes the etiquette. It doesn't change the leadership principles sitting behind it. And then the final theme that, I, that I've pulled out, and this came through really strongly and as you can imagine, quite quite passionately. Leaders are failing to hold people accountable, both positively and negatively. And I think the negatively one is quite, is quite obvious uh, in a lot of our eyes. But the number of people I spoke to that said, you know, they weren't being rewarded or recognized or praised was quite alarming, certainly from my perspective. Um, the sorts of things that they, they were saying to me was, you know, some of my colleagues are having a paid holiday while I'm doing their work for them. You know, and for me, that talks directly to somebody saying, I'm not being recognized for all the work I'm doing. You know, I'm actually going above and beyond here. And, and I'm really not being recognized for it. I would argue that for both of these comments here, and I'll get to the second one shortly, but I would argue that leaders are probably not holding those who are on holiday negatively accountable either. It's almost as though, you know, they're out of sight, therefore out of mind. Um, that second quote there uh, was actually said in a, in a very positive way. Sorry, it was, let me rephrase that. It was around positive accountability in the sense that, you know, I'm out of sight, I'm away from where my, my leader is. I'm working really hard and I'm not getting recognition. I see this as both positive and negative accountability that's not happening. Somebody is out of sight, therefore they're not being held accountable for things that they aren't doing. Okay. So those really are the three key themes that, that, uh, that I've picked up coming out of this. There are by no means uh, only three, like I've mentioned. There are a number more. I think these ones are, are ones that we feel quite strongly from uh, and absolutely Dom would, you know, going back to you Ian, but Dom would love to get uh, your experiences around, you know, watching the game, the etiquette that goes around it, setting the standards uh, and then holding people accountable. You know, these are things that leaders need to be doing. The fact that we are sitting apart from each other shouldn't change that. Okay. Ian, that uh, from my side is, is where I got to. Yeah. Dave, thank you for that. Um, certainly these are some uh, themes which will resonate with some of us, um, and especially some of us who have uh, actually been doing this remote leadership thing for years. Um, to address a couple of the 
questions that have come through on the chat. Um, firstly, we will be distributing these slides afterwards. In fact, um, before we distribute them, we are going to add to them based on what um, is shared today. Um, so we will obviously get some insights from Dom, but hopefully we'll get insights from other people who are participating in the chat and we will add those to the slides and then distribute them. Um, a second question that came through, what is watching the game? And just to be um, explicit about this, it's a coaching analogy. So in the same way as a coach can only improve um, his or her team by watching the game and understanding what is required for improvement, uh, rather than just keeping an eye on the scoreboard. So what we often do in business is we often keep an eye on the scoreboard, believing that the score is going to change if we watch the score hard enough. And that's not how scores change. Scores change because we change what we're doing on the input side. And, um, and we believe that you know, a lot of people spend far too much time poring over the results spreadsheets rather than really trying to understand what, is, what are the quality criteria that have gone into this in the first place. So that's what we talk about um, watching the game. And, and I'm uh, going to be fascinated to hear what Dom has to say about watching the game. Because when you're sitting remotely, how do you watch the game? You, know, um, you don't necessarily have a video feed into this, person's, uh, into this person's home or into this person's remote working space. So um, how do you do that? Right. Um, I'm going to hand over to you, Dom, with the first, uh, the first kind of issue that Dave picked up on, which is um, how do you go about clarifying or setting the standards, the expectations, the rules of engagement, the ways of working, which um, in legitimate leadership speak, enable a supportive working environment for people to uh, to be their best um yeah, thanks Ian. so i think um f for many um they're in a slightly different situation to the one that that i'm in right now because uh in, in my current role which has now been about four years it's actually been a, a remote situation from the first day um and the current business is actually uh, a business we started from scratch. So it was a startup where the context was that I was remote right from the beginning. And then as I started to hire into my team, it just turned out that they were all remote from the beginning. <clears throat> and that's kind of how it stuck. Um, and so in, in many ways, we haven't had this kind of break to deal with where people are very used to their traditional office environment um, within a culture that's already established. And so, so and in many ways, I would say that's actually more difficult. Um, but, but for us, we've been quite lucky in that we've been able to lean on and leverage many of the, of the tools that we have in our industry. So I'm, I'm in the industry of technology um, and I work with a lot of software people. And so there've been lots of tools and techniques that have been used over time that were like ex extremely useful to us. But the one thing that tools are never gonna give you is those agreements on how we want to do things as a team. And so what we tried to do early on is make sure that the communication um, principles that we use uh, were kind of agreed on by everybody um, and also then put into practice by everybody. But then, you know, what you don't want to do is make hard and fast rules around these things and these principles and then stick to them no matter what. So for us, it was very important. So I'll take the, the example of communication to talk deliberately about how we communicate with each other. When do we communicate with each other and what to expect when you communicate with somebody. So uh, again, just leaning on that example a little bit, what is the difference between an email type of communication versus something like an instant messaging communication versus a video kind of chat versus, you know, plain old cell phones when, 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 when you need them. And each is useful within their context, but it's, it's really important to, to kind of have those meta conversations with people in your team about what's going to work. And so again, in our environment, we're extremely um, flexible about when people do their work because we feel it's extremely important that 
people are able to fit their daily lives and their work together in a way that makes them most productive. And so from day one, when you come into our organization, we like to give people what I call the crystal ball of trust. So here you go. You have this from the first day that you arrive. Please don't break it. Don't drop it. And so when they have that trust and they see the behavior of others in the team, knowing that, you know, they can do things like watch their children play a sport, or they can do things like go to the shops that are only open during office hours to get things done or go and renew their, their license. Because we know that the way we communicate is there's a, there's a meeting in the morning at a time that suits everyone. So it's a kind of a reasonable time that we all agreed on and established up front. We're all in that meeting. We all have our video turned on in that meeting because the point of that meeting is more about human interaction than it is about getting updates. It's about seeing each other. It's about knowing the other people are okay. It's about reading the cues on their faces, hearing the, you know, potential tiredness in their voices and understanding where everybody's at kind of in their, in their head space for the day. So I'm kind of going quite deep into that one topic, but that's just an example of how we, we, we work hard to set the expectations in our environment around certain topics. Um, you know, and, and I can talk a little bit more about that as well when we start to uh, get into to watching the game piece, because again, it's, it's deliberate effort. And then it's about listening. So our role as leaders is to constantly ask people, is it working for you? Um, and how is it working for you and, and, and what is not working for you? And then adjusting that, you know, um, again, in, in the tech industry, they're useful tools and mechanisms like retrospectives. But what we actually found is in the rest of Simply, um, the other teams like our marketing teams and our actuarial teams are starting to pick up on some of the, some of the tools that we use um, to, to kind of run their teams, which are completely non-technical. Uh, and things like retrospectives, which is, again, just a way to sit down and say, you know, how are things going? What has worked well over the past period and what has not worked well? What are we going to change? What are we going to keep doing? Um, and that kind of stuff. And, and again, like you can hear the common theme here is, is, is talking about things, agreeing on them up front, deciding as a team what those principles are going to be that you are going to uh, abide by and then how are you going to do that together. Um, for, for those of you who are not part of the tech industry, um, a meta conversation is a conversation about a conversation <laughs> in the same way that metadata is data about data. So just so you know, <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> Dom I'll, isn't I'll, actually I'll... speaking a different language. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, I guess that, that's, that's kind of some of the most, the more recent, uh, experience. And, and I have to say it's, it's. Uh, the reason why I reach for it uh, right now because it's 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 the most extreme example of this uh, remote working and remote leadership that, that I've had. Um, in, in previous businesses, we had a situation with with very big teams spread like across very vast territories. So we had it, we had about um, in my last interaction with a, with a fairly big telco operator, we had teams spread across 10 countries, uh, across about 60 different organizations that were subcontracting in various, in various roles. Uh, and, and many of them were remote, but the difference there was that the bulk of the core project team were, were co-located and, and worked together in one, in one space. And so that also introduces its own challenges because one important thing to realize is that if you have one remote person in the team, the entire team, needs to behave uh, as though they're remote. If one person's remote, everybody's actually got to behave like that it's a remote team. Uh, and, and for many reasons. I mean, I think um, in order for people to, to not lose out on the water cooler conversations, on the, um, you know, let, let's quickly solve this problem. We're all going to stay late and kind of get this done, which, which you've been able to leverage now it completely falls away when you have people who are key to your team and they're just not physically there. Um, and so as soon as you're in that situation, in which, like many of us find ourselves in that situation now, um, but, but you have to be much more conscious about it and much more deliberate about 
the, the kinds of things you used to take for granted. Um, and, and they will not happen naturally. I think that's a key takeaway for me is in terms of expectations, you cannot lean on anything that you know now or have worked in before in, in an in-office situation. You have to actually sit down, gain, get, gather some feedback from your teams and start talking about how you have to do things differently uh, in, in, in a remote context. Um, Dom, you used the word deliberate a couple of times. And, uh, and I think this is one of the th themes that I've picked up on um, in my time uh, leading remotely is um, being deliberate or being intentional about how you do things. Um, you know, in a, in a non-remote world, you have literally got a building, people come in at eight o'clock, they leave at five. Um, those um, movements themselves set up boundaries, they set up, uh, um, they set up norms. Do you have a framework that you use for clarifying these things in, in your world? Or do you just go about it saying, what, what should we do? I mean, do you have a kind of a, a template that you work through with people talking about how we use different channels, how we uh, go? What, what should people on this call be thinking about when they set up these kinds of norms and ways of working with their teams? So I think it's, it's difficult because I think I feel it's highly dependent on the kind of work that you're doing. Um, and a very simple example of, of, of why I'm saying that is, are you customer facing or not? Um, even, even if you're, you're like a remote customer facing uh, and, and to some extent that will drive um, how you're able to set things up. And, and we are very lucky in our team is that none of us are, are external customer facing. Well, we, we have some partners that we manage, but, but on, on the large, uh, we don't have those, that, that, that specific challenge. And so we haven't leaned very hard on any frameworks or any, um, you know, anything that I, that I could think is, is, is generic that, 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 that I could, you know, point to. We just, I guess it, it kind of has naturally evolved this way because we started off with a very small team and as it's grown, we, we've learned that the way we did things yesterday didn't work as well today because our context has changed slightly. Uh, there are more people to, to kind of share with and more people to make sure that, you know, that, that they're happy and, and getting what they need to do done. So, yeah, I guess I guess the answer is probably not 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 one that people like to hear. But generally, um, I found that by asking people what the areas are uh, that are, are comfortable for them or not comfortable for them uh, when when we're working in our team and in a remote context, you know that's that's where we've kind of tried to work on the things that are not going well and reinforce the things that are going well. Uh, but the one key thing to to kind of remember is that many people think they would like working remotely and that they want to work remotely. It's different doing it uh, for a short period of time. It's usually always uh, very, very nice in the beginning, but it's also extremely hard to do it for very long periods of time. And, and that's where that kind of deliberateness that I keep talking about comes from because uh, people who are isolated get lonely. Some people don't have families and they're literally alone. And how do you start to deal with that kind of thing? Um, and, 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 you know, I haven't seen frameworks out there that kind of talk to th that human element um, to help you address some of that stuff. But I think in terms of expectations, uh, the context is going to be extremely important, but I still believe that at the core, you have to give people that trust right up front and mm -hmm. You have to make sure that everyone understands that I, I need to know what's going on, but not because I'm looking over your shoulder, but because I want to allow you the space to do what you need to do in the times, in the time that, that actually suits you. Um, and so I guess if you talk to kind of the, the legitimate leadership framework, you know, it's that what's my intent behind asking you uh, what you're doing on a daily basis and, and asking you to, to make your work visible in a place that anyone can go and have a look at it. Um, and people do that very willingly knowing that it's not because 
I want to look over your shoulder, but it's because I want to create space for you to do the things that you need to do as part of your life. Yeah. Um, Dom, you mentioned this word intent and, and you know, you would have heard me say it's all about intent. Um, how do you, how do you signal intent as a remote leader? You know, if you're working with people, you can signal your t intent very frequently. Simple little things, making somebody a cup of tea, wandering around, being respectful, making sure you don't interrupt people um, when, when you shouldn't. There are hundreds of ways that you can um, demonstrate your intent in an office environment uh, on a daily basis. How do you, how do you demonstrate intent? You know, how do your team know the quality of character um, that you have? Um, so I think it's, it's, it's strange. I, I can give you an example. Actually, there's, a, there's someone in our team, I won't name names who, who joined our business, and I could see from their behavior uh, that they had had a really rough time in previous, previous businesses in terms of, um, what, how can I put it, in terms of being micromanaged uh, without any trust. Because uh, I, I, in the beginning, I was getting two emails a day from this individual outlining exactly what they had done, showing me where I could go and see what they had done kind of just like trying to make sure that I understood, like I'm actually working, you know. Um, and I guess over time, the behavior that they see from me and how you respond to situations that, that are difficult, you know, when something goes bad, how you respond to those situations, um, I, I think is, 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 is key. You know, you, if, if, you're, if you're saying one thing in terms of our values and our principles and the way we want to behave and doing something else, when the situation gets tough, that's, that's showing like the opposite of the intent. So you really have to make the, the principles and the values that the team's establishing up front have to be real. And then you have to go the extra mile to show that intent. So you actually have to say to people on a daily basis, if, if necessary, like, you know, someone will say to you, for example, I need to go and uh, I need to go and renew my license. I'm going to take half a day of leave today. And you have to say to them, no, you don't have to take half a day of leave today. You're going to just go and get your license done, get back to work when you can, and just keep over and over reinforcing, demonstrating that, that, that the valuables that you all agreed on are actually real and that people can trust them. Um, so, so I guess, you know, what, what I do personally is just, just try to make sure that I'm not if I'm uncomfortable with something that the team is asking for as, as a value, for example, and I, and I can't think of one right now, but I would rather tell them right up front and say, I'm not comfortable with that for these reasons, than just go along with it and then act in a different, in a different way later down the line. Because you don't have nonverbal cues of work, walking around an office and that kind of thing to, to, to rely on, you know, that, so, so you have to be very, very, honest, deliberate, specific, uh, and put the effort in on a daily basis to, to reinforce that. Yeah. Um, can I pick up there on, uh, you, you were talking about open and honest, or honest specifically. One of the things that came through as a big positive in, in the conversations that I've had, and also you know, from, from my experiences, is when you're remote, there's absolutely no room for ambiguity. In, in communication, in signaling your intent, you absolutely have to be really, really clear yeah. um, about what it is that you are saying or what you mean. And a really nice example that I, I heard was one, one person said to me, you know, we were asked to put in a little bit more effort for the next couple of months. And their view of that was, what does a little bit more effort actually mean? Are you asking me to do two hours of extra work a day? Are you asking me to, you know, work till 10 o'clock so that we can have a call at nine o'clock at night? And I found that quite a, a, quite a neat insight into, you know, this, this concept that when you're remote, as you said, Dom, there are no verbal cues to pick up on. No, uh, sorry, non-visual cues, sorry, to pick up on. Not easily anyway. And so, you know, if, typically if somebody says something, you can see with, whether they have conviction behind what they're saying. And if you can't see what they're saying, it's, uh, you know, if you can't see them while they're saying it, I think there's a, 
you really, as a leader, have to think very carefully about the message that you're putting across. You have to be very clear. I don't know if you agree with that, but it's... Uh, yeah, ab- absolutely. In fact, you, you've, you've made me think, um, you know, it, it's quite strange to me hearing that there, there are people who are trying to squeeze extra effort out of, out of people just because they're at home. And when, in fact, what I've found is exactly the opposite. I have to stop people mm. from working all the time when they're working from home. Um, I always find when someone new comes onto the team, <clears throat> I see it happen and they're kind of working like all hours of the night and it's not like they're working only at night and not during the day and, and have some sort of balance. They are specifically like just working all the time. And, and what you get very quickly is a situation where people burn out mm. and then not only does the work quality drop, but you know, the kind of personality disappears, you know, and, and you've, even though you're remote, you still have to establish a, a, a culture of some kind where people f- like have a sense of belonging and they enjoy the interactions with each other, even though they're, they're kind of digital interactions. Um, and so I've had to hold people back and tell them like, uh, you know, I'm always saying to people, uh, they're like, I'll have that ready on Monday. And the first thing I'm saying is, please don't work on the weekend for, for that. You know, and, but everyone understands that there are in- occasions, and I've never had to ask people to do it, but there are occasions where there's a go live and things, you know, there's, there's a precious situation, but that should not be the norm. It should be once or twice a year where people are doing that. Um, and I just find people are much more willing to... Um, to go over over and above what's normally expected from them in an office, but just because they're working from home, I, I don't know why. So, mm-hmm. you know, I can't give you any insights insights in, into how that, that works. But if you don't manage it, your people burn out and then everybody suffers from it. Um, Dom, thank you for those insights. And, uh, and please continue to... Um, to submit questions on the chat. Um, a question has come through, which is gonna move us on to the next topic. And, and that question is, um, how do you actually go about watching the game remotely? Okay. So from, from our perspective, again, like I said before, in the software industry, there are many tools and, and things that you can lean on um, to help you see how things are going but not too many that tell you how people are doing. Uh, and they're two different kind of, kind of things. So, so I'll talk a little bit about both. Um, so in terms of watching the game of, of, of how the work is going, we, we, we use two, two key things, I would say. And that is number one, the daily meeting that I spoke about. So we, we call it our standup. Um, but the way we run our standup is not to, to have people tell you what they did yesterday and tell you what they are going to do today. Some people choose to do that because they find it's helpful to hold themselves accountable. Uh, and in fact, this is a recent change. So, so th- that's probably a useful insight for people is it used to be that everyone spoke, everyone had a turn. They spoke about what, how yesterday went. They spoke about what the, day, the, the plan for today was going to be. And then they also raised any kind of concerns or issues that they were having. Um, and I changed it because I could see that people were starting to resent the meeting. It wasn't giving them what I wanted it to give them, which was that sense of connection with the team. Um, and so I changed it to, right, what we're going to do is those that want to give an update about how things are going can do so. Uh, those who uh, have issues that they need to raise where they need help, please do so. And other than that, it's how are you doing? How's everyone feeling today? You know, did everyone get a good night's sleep? It's that kind of conversation. It's much more casual. It's much more kind of <clears throat> asking my, my friends and colleagues how they are, <clears throat> excuse me, how, how they are doing. Um, and, but, but that doesn't, doesn't work well on its own. And so what we've done is we, we've always managed the actual physical work uh, in, a, in a system called, called Trello. So we manage our work. Uh, and what Trello is, is uh, you, you, can, <clears throat> you can create uh, what we call tickets. So you create a, a, a requirement, if you, if you will, you, you, you describe what it's about, and then you can move it around into different phases of work. So, so it's easy to see where it is 
it's easy to see who's working on it. And the, again, the agreement here is that we can use the daily stand-up meeting to solve for, for other things, to solve for the, the human connectedness uh, factors that, that we need to solve for. But then we need somewhere else where the work is visible. And so that, that's kind of a social contract that we have now that what that means is if I keep my uh, Trello board up to date and my tickets up to date and I've, uh, I've had my daily stand up, no one's going to bother me for the rest of the day and I can get my stuff done that I need to get done. Because if anyone needs to know where something is, how long it's still going to be, uh, there's a place to go and find that. And so generally the rule is in the business, if other, if my colleagues in, in the Exco need to know what's happening, they can talk to me. I can go and have a look on the board and tell them where, where things are. And so that kind of is how we, we solve for, for kind of what's going on and how people are feeling. But then there's also that, uh, that element of, you know, to go back to the coaching analogy, how do I help people become better? Yeah, so that, I think, sorry, Dom, so I'd, I'd love to spend some time on this point because yes. you know, there, is a little bit of, there is a little bit of this about how do you have your check-in before the game and, and how do you know where people are and, and how do you see the scoreboard. But the thing that seems to be missing for me at the moment is this coaching type of input, this mm. actually helping people to get better at what they do. And, yep. and this idea that, well, how am I supposed to know what so-and-so is doing? How, you know, how am I supposed to know how they're doing it? Um, because I'm not there. And I'm, yep. and I'm never there to provide advice. So how do you yep. solve for that? And and so and the other question is, I know there are a lot of people who are not on this, um, who are not in the tech industry on the call. So um, maybe Dave also thinking about how how some of these concepts apply in manufacturing or in retail or you know in these different environments. Yeah, um, yeah. So I mean, I think th there's a few ways that we. Um, that I would say serve as entry points into what I'm about to say, but a, a technique that we try and use quite a lot is a mix of, uh, uh, and I'll make it more general for, for everyone in, in, in the call who's kind of not in tech, but there's this principle of doing work together. Uh, and in tech, you know, you, you, you can kind of, um, you can work on, on a piece of, of functionality together where you can share your screen and you both kind of see, see what you, you're seeing. And, and you can kind of solve that problem together. Um, we call it pair programming. Um, but, but that principle is not unique to our industry. Um, mm. So uh, it's, it's very useful. And so that's the one side of really working with someone on a task um, and, and, and going through that together. Uh, and you've got to be careful. You don't want to be doing it for them while they watch you. That's not achieving kind of anything, but you really want, you know, it's kind of in our world, it's the, the person who, who's learning is doing the typing and the other person is there for advice and feedback in real time. Then we, we have this uh, secondary process, which is once a piece of work is done, someone else will do a review on the piece of work. Now in our, in our world, that's looking at some code, looking at a, a setup of technology, but in other worlds that potentially actually putting in the effort to read through an output, a deliverable, whether it's a PowerPoint slide deck, uh, a Word document and giving constructive feedback. Um, mm. And you have to be very careful uh, when you give this feedback because um, number one, my preference is always to give difficult feedback face to face. So over Zoom. Uh, written communication is so easy to take out of context. It has no uh, emotion associated with it. Um, and I've seen way too many like misunderstandings and blow ups over things which are actually completely non-issues of two people were standing and, and, and talking to one another. Um, but that, that actual practice of looking at somebody's work and then providing feedback is not something that will happen unless you actually put in the, put in the effort to do so. Um, and then when you're providing feedback, you know, let's say there's 10 things that are wrong. You can't help somebody by making them fix all 10 things. So pick three, pick the, the worst three or the top three uh, that you want to provide feedback on and just do those three this time. And next time around, you're going to catch some other ones. 
you know, it's, it's kind of just being, being very careful about that. So, so that's, it's really two things. It's feedback on work completed, but it's also um, allowing for processes where people can do things together when, when one party is, is new to it and needs to learn and another party is experienced. I find that works extremely well um, to, to help that kind of growth. And then those entry points that I mentioned is how do you know when to do that? And that goes back to being very specific with your team and the values and the culture that you're establishing to say, there's nothing wrong with asking for help. Uh, we celebrate people asking for help. We, we, you know, we, we allow people to say, I don't know how to do this. Can someone please, you know, do it with me and show me for the first time. There's no other way, you know, otherwise you, so, so, so that, that's the one entry point. When we see people who may think that they kind of got the problem when they go off and they work, you need to have a gauge for like how long I, I feel that that would have taken somebody who has the, the experience to do that task. And when it really starts to grind on, you know, it's like catching someone who's falling off a cliff. You, you, you're just going to very gently say to them, hey man, I, I see you struggling with this thing. Would you like someone to sit with you and just take a look at it with you? Um, so it's being proactive about it without, without them having asked for help. Um, I just want to jump in there. One of the things that from, from my view here as well is we can't, we're not going to get away from the technology side of things. If you're remote, we need to use technology to, to, be, to, to come together. That mm. I, I think needs to be a base rule. What I want to emphasize and reiterate is that the principle of that buddy system, I think you call it peer programming, rubber ducking, bub, yeah, buddy system, those principles remain consistent throughout. Yep. You know, if, if, if you're a designer designing clothes, for example, there's nothing stopping you having a peer to sit with you and work through some of your ideas. Sometimes from a critical perspective, other times from a neutral perspective, I think there are two very different ways you can do that. What I would like to emphasize is that irrespective of the industry that you're in, these principles remain, you know, and buddying in my experience is, is a really good one. You know, somebody that you, I would suggest is not somebody that you report to, not somebody that, uh, you know, needs, that you need to, uh, you know, be, be accountable to essentially. Um, the neutral support buddy system works really, really well. Yep. Um, in my experience. And I mean, I've got an IT background, but in non-IT areas as well, um, you know, it absolutely. But to get back to that initial point, you're not going to get away from technology. Yep. That, that's just a given. Um, so, so lean on the technology people because they've been doing this for a long time. Yeah, I mean, you're 100% right. I've seen, so, so actually, funnily enough, my wife started a new job uh, she's a pharmacist. She started a new job after lockdown and they've never, she's never met her colleagues physically, never. Uh, and that, that is completely non-technical work. Uh, it's regulatory mm -hmm. pharmacy work. So it's almost more of a legal context. And we see like they are getting great results from using the technology, buddying up, looking at things together, uh, coming up with useful frameworks and tools that like, this is when I do my reviews, I pull all these things into this format and it really helps me do things better and, and just learning from each other constantly. So, so it, can, it can really work in, in non-technical mm. uh, industries if you use the technical tooling that's there. But I just want to mention, I actually saw a question on Slack, but it's, it's relevant to what we're talking about now in terms of the always on communication in terms of the technology. Um, we fell into the trap very early on of uh, this always on communication, responding at all hours, treating instant messaging like it needs instant response. And it was a very hard lesson for us to realize that it doesn't deserve instant response. If there is urgency associated with something that you need and you really need someone to talk to or reply to you, that's what the telephone is for. So, We've, we've gone completely back to the fact that you can use tools like Slack or any kind of, you know, Microsoft Teams, the instant messaging stuff is available, but it's not fair for you to re, re, uh, expect someone to just drop what they're doing and reply to you just because, just because you've chosen that moment to send them something. But we all again have the understanding that if there's something urgent, someone's going to phone me and, and that's when I'll pick up the phone. And it just, it just simplifies that whole kind of thing 
a little bit, knowing knowing those rules uh, ahead of time. Mm. Yeah, I mean, it does talk talk to the to, to the rules that we spoke about um, mm. earlier. Um, Dom, we only have a, a few minutes left, and I do want to touch on this accountability thing. Yeah. Right. And um, you know, I think that there's a lot of failure to hold people positively accountable, as in failure to give people recognition. We oil the squeaky yep. wheel. Um, but in a, uh, a discussion that we had a few days ago, you mentioned that it is actually possible to give people censure feedback um, and to give people tough feedback remotely. And, and your view that um, there are too many people who are, who are not holding people accountable and using the excuse, well, when I see them in person, I'll tell them. Yep. Um, and so I put this off unnecessarily. Uh, do you mind talking about that for a few minutes and then we will, um, and then sure. we'll wrap up? <clears throat> so I think, um, <clears throat> again, we, we only learned that lesson because we, we got it wrong in the beginning uh, because it's very tough. Uh, and in fact, the, the first few times trying to be more gentle, uh, I actually am guilty of trying to use the written communications, the, the, the tooling, you know, the instant messaging type tooling. And, and it, it's a complete failure. It's just like, just don't do it. Um, and so, so we got that very wrong and you actually, you can see how it impacts people. You know, when, when you're giving someone negative feedback where you, where you actually want a change in their performance, you do want them to feel like something has gone wrong, but you also want them to have hope that there is an opportunity to improve. And, and you just don't get that with, with a wall of text, right? So what we found is remote kind of censure feedback. And this is just our rule. I need to be able to look at you and you need to be able to look at me. Um, so it's cameras on, it's a zoom session um, and, and we need to have a tough discussion. And then, while you're doing that, just be human about it. Um, you know, you just recognizing that there is another person on the end of this screen that you're looking at. Um, but, you know, we've absolutely had to, we've had to dismiss people remotely, not, not luckily not in my team, but in our business, we, we've had to go through those, those very hard discussions where we've had to have a, a kind of labor third party on the call recorded, you know, we, we've had written disciplinary kind of uh, situations in our business all done remotely because you have to. Putting it off is actually worse. And what it does is it impacts everybody else in the team because when there's someone who's either not performing or uh, like really hurting the common culture by behaving in a way that's not kind of uh, in agreement with those norms and rules uh, and, and principles that everyone agreed on up front, it starts to impact everybody when they see your inaction. They no longer feel safe. Um, so being remote is not an excuse to just let the stuff lie down. I don't actually think it's any more, if, if I think about it, I don't think it's any easier doing it in person face to face than it is over video. In fact, if anything to me personally, it's a little, more, it's a little less comfortable having someone in the room with you. Um, so yeah, we've absolutely had to do it and it's never nice, uh, but, it, but I think the consequences of not doing it in, 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 uh, and letting things fester within your team is, is far worse. Um, but I will say that even though I've, I've just said it, it's, it's, it's hard to do, it's actually easier to do negative feedback than it is to, to give positive feedback. And again, I come back to that being deliberate, being deliberate thing, because when things are going really well, you just tend to, you know, continue going really well. And you have to remind yourself on a continual basis, uh, book those one-on-ones with people so that you can start off and tell them like, you know, the purpose of this session is purely for me to say thank you, purely for me to say things are going really great. These are the things I've noticed that you're doing that are really positive to the rest of the team. Please, you know, carry on as much as you can. Um, you have to have noticed though, Don. And I think correct. that's what a lot of people are getting wrong is that they literally don't ha can't have that conversation because they haven't noticed what's going right. Yeah, yeah. And I guess that's back to the watching the game is you... you uh, and, and I don't know if there's a silver bullet. I think it, it's taken us time to build a culture. It's taken us time to get to the point where people feel safe enough and they feel 
good in the environment enough to to make everything that did, that they do uh, you know quite visible so we have a very healthy lively team chat you know that people utilize where you can see you know if, if two people are, are, are doing work and I'm not part of that interaction I wouldn't know about it unless somebody told me about it and so it's really great that what will happen straight away is they'll complete that call and one of them will, will you know the person who was helped usually will come into the chat and say hey thanks very much George for helping me with that thing. I was really struggling. And then they'll share with the rest of the team, you know, this is kind of the gist of what we were doing and this is how we solved it. So everyone can, can learn from that. That kind of culture is something that's taken time to build um, where, uh, and then it's easy for me to see, you know, and, and, uh, and respond to. Yeah. Yeah, I, um, in, in the previous organization I mentioned earlier where I used to work, we had, there was a really fantastic culture of just recognition and, um, mm -hmm. amongst people. And I think it really drives positive behavior, which is fantastic. Mm. Um, Dom, thank you. We are, we are out of time, but it's been uh, really brilliant to have you um, online. I know that I haven't addressed every single That's question. Brilliant. We'll try and go through the chat and make sure that we address all of the questions uh, later. Dave, do you have any last thoughts? I don't. I have, I have one example, Dom, that you shared with us that I, I wish you'd shared today. And I think we might just have skipped over it. Um, and I'm going to take the opportunity oh, just yes. to give people something to think about, if you don't mind. Um, yeah. in, 30 the, seconds. in 30 seconds, I'll do it really quickly. One of the things that Dom shared with us on Monday is that they have, in the past, and are about to kick it off again, had a Zoom meeting that they run basically for the working day if I can paraphrase that. Yeah. And that is a meeting that is just on and you don't, you're not actually part of the meeting, but at any point you can turn around and go, Hey, Ian, I was just thinking about this. Can we chat about it? Essentially what you guys did. And if I can be a bit mm. critical, but in a, in a, in a crude way is you created a virtual room. Yeah. I think the results that you shared with us from that are really fantastic is that, you know, you can use creative ways to create these virtual rooms, you know, and let people feel as though they've just looked across and had a chat with their, with their colleague. Um, yeah, and I thought that was a really useful tool. Yeah. yeah, sorry, I actually wrote it in my notes and forgot to mention it, but, but it's worth saying that the intent there was always to create a, a virtual office because we had a situation where only the tech team was remote and everyone else had, was in the office. And so we were trialing, would it work to have this concept of like being there in the office virtually at all times? Uh, but just for everyone, it, it was completely um, optional. People opted in and you joined and you stayed on mute unless you had something to, to kind of talk about. And it, and it works extremely well. Works extremely well. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you, Dave. Thank you, Dom. Don't be surprised if you get invited back for another <laughs> in conversation with session. Um, no Anyone who level. has any questions or any thoughts, please um, get in touch with us directly. We will send an email out um, following this call with the slides and also with some of the key points that um, Dom and Dave have mentioned as we've uh, gone on today. And um, also highlighting some of the work that we are doing in the space of leading remotely some of the, uh, some of the programs which we are currently writing out in organizations to help managers with this uh, very tricky issue. Um, and uh, and uh, we're uh, we're seeing a lot of uh, positive progress with. So thanks everyone, and um, we will see you again. We do this uh, every now and again, and uh, and we talk about it on LinkedIn. Thanks very much. Bye. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you everybody. Us. Thanks, Dom. Yes, thanks, Dave. Thanks, Dom. <laughs>